we talked last time about pregnancy stuff, and we got about halfway into it and had basically just finished up the normal delivery section. And by the way, if, if I don't appear to be, if you can't hear me, then uh, holler at me, but uh, I think we got it fixed. So again, uh, if anything comes up, pregnancy. Pregnancy, pregnancy, pregnancy. <clears throat> uh, pregnancy is, again, scary because it involves two patients, and we're not entirely sure what to do with it because we don't see that many pregnant people, and we've heard that there's things about it, and it's sort of like kids, where like, we make it probably a bigger deal than it has to happen. Um, but keep in mind, there's just a few really important things that uh, we talked about last time. Number one, vital signs change in pregnancy. So you get more blood volume, your hematocrit decreases, uh, although the total amount of circulating you know, cells is increased. Uh, but blood volume goes up, heart rate goes up uh, by about 10 to 15 percent, respirations go up, cardiac output goes up. The only thing that really goes down is blood pressure. So, and this will be important in a few minutes when we get into some of the complications and stuff. Blood pressure in a pregnant person, if they don't have hypertension or some problem, uh, typically, you know, between 100 and 110. So uh, that, that's a normal blood pressure. Um, but despite that, everything else that you see should go up with it. Now, oh wow, uh, there it is right off the bat, just, just really opened up into that. This is a normal delivery. Keep in mind that babies have been delivering themselves for most of human history, and only in the last maybe, you know, 200 years has this really been a thing. Keep in mind, baby is going to come out typically looking backwards, uh, at least from mom. They find a nuchal cord, so they reduce it. They loop that uh, cord around uh, to the front side of the baby so it's not stuck. As baby comes out, he's going to kind of stick his head out, and then he's going to turn, just like you see there. And there he goes. <clears throat> um, they are working right now. At that point, you need to start grabbing the baby. And your job during most of this, in most cases, is going to be to keep the baby from shooting out uh, so that it doesn't cause tears to mom and you don't drop the baby. Now, these guys are incredibly slippery. So as soon as you get the shoulders out, uh, as they've kind of done here, baby is essentially going to try to escape you. And so you need to grab him either kind of up around the, the clavicle, um, grab him around the torso, grab him around his leg, put, be able to put your fingers around some part of the little baby, otherwise he's gonna to try to escape. And those are the big tips for normal deliveries. Now, when you get into complicated deliveries, it's, there's a certain amount of time, uh, only a certain amount of time that I would spend trying to fix any sort of complicated delivery in the field. Uh, it is very difficult to deliver a baby in a moving ambulance, um, but there's also a limited number of things. The best thing you can usually do for uh, a person who has any sort of complicated delivery, if you had to just pick something simple, is put them in that McRoberts position, you know, the, the knees far flexed up under the chest, try to open up the uh, pelvis as much as, as much as possible. And if that doesn't work, there's really not a lot that you can do otherwise uh, in terms of a baby that doesn't seem to be coming out. So at that point, I would start beating it pretty quick to the hospital. And there's other complications too. Again, prolapse. If you see a cord prolapse, uh, you want to reach in and keep the try to keep the baby actually from coming out. So take your fingers and uh, lift the baby up, push him up against uh, mom to try to get him off of the cord so he doesn't squish the umbilical cord. Um, <clears throat> Breach deliveries a lot of times will work out just fine, but sometimes won't. So again, how much time are you going to spend on scene? That's a question I have to leave to you and say, what exactly is the situation here? And this is a good time to involve medical control. Uh, so call, call your local medical control and say, hey, <laughs> uh, there's a foot. Do we go to the hospital or do we try to deliver it? And a lot of times that guy's probably going to say, guy or gal is probably going to say go to the hospital. Anyway, that's the sum up from what we did last time. So you have just delivered a baby in a house. We took mom and the baby to the same hospital uh, because that's a good thing to do. Don't, don't split them up and make one go to the kid, children's hospital and the other one go to the uh, adult hospital. Take them someplace where they have OB. And at that point, it probably doesn't have to be lights and sirens. Just take it easy. we got plenty of time. Baby's out uh, as long as everybody's doing okay. Now, you, uh, of course, made a mess in the back of the ambulance after your last case, which was a uh, postpartum hemorrhage, if I recall. Um, <clears throat> you deliver the baby, you clean out the truck, or no, had a little bit of hemorrhage, not too much, but still made a mess. So we clean out the truck, uh, and lunch sounds good, and we get a call about an 18-year-old, this time with vaginal bleeding, which has been the theme of the day. You arrive and you find this 18-year-old girl with what appears to be a healthy new baby. Baby is vigorous, moving around. She delivered uneventfully about an hour prior to uh, calling 911, but then never really stopped bleeding. 
and it was a home birth and the family didn't really want to go to the hospital and the, the friend slash whatever you call those guys that came over and sort of talked her through it uh, said, yeah, seems to be bleeding a lot. And you lift up the sheet and you just find this big, uh, I'm going to stand in the middle of it. Uh, you find that on the floor. Like, oh, that's distressing. And more clot seems to be actively coming out of the patient. And the patient's getting a little bit pale and kind of tachycardic and maybe acting a little bit goofy. <clears throat> and she's getting clammy. And she's a little confused. Now she starts asking who you are and why you're here and starts trying to get away from you. Uh, incidents of postpartum hemorrhage. What was, what's always been the uh, big killer of pregnant women or recently pregnant women has been hemorrhage, uh, by far. Uh, I think it's hemorrhage first, PE second, and preeclampsia third, if I remember the, the three causes. We'll get into a little more of those other things later. But talk about the hemorrhage part first. Postpartum hemorrhage. If you deliver a baby and then you start massaging, you can't see that, I realize, you start massaging the uh, abdomen, massaging the fundus, what you should feel is the fundus of the uterus go from sort of a bloggy, a boggy, you know, just kind of belly feeling thing to kind of tighten up. And it, it literally feels like another fist that you'll be pushing your fingers against uh, as you're doing the, the uterine massage. <clears throat> if you don't feel that hard fist, uh, then that's probably a case of uterine atony. And that's one of the most common reasons for folks to have postpartum hemorrhage. The, the uterus just doesn't tighten up. Now, again, this may happen, and we, it doesn't happen that much in the hospital because they immediately start them on uh, Pitocin, and they do the good fundal massage, and they really watch out for it. But folks that deliver at home, uh, this could potentially happen to and go more or less undiagnosed for a couple of hours, and in which case the patient might be in pretty significant trouble. So other reasons that it might happen that are less, uh, less common, retain placentas. Again, home births be a big, uh, big case where this may show up, probably not in the hospital. Uh, uterine rupture may happen or uterine inversion may happen. <clears throat> That's if you push on the belly and you just have a soft uterus that doesn't feel like a, a fist pushing back on you. If you do feel that fist when you push on the belly, though, uh, push on the uterine fundus, then you have to suspect that this may be a laceration. What do you do for it? Either way, uh, and by the way, lacerations typically just kind of need to be repaired. Uh, there's not a whole lot that, uh, uh, that you can do other than putting direct pressure on it if you can see it to stop that. What do you do for it? Well, you treat mom for shock. If mom's in shock, uh, you do the same stuff that always. Now remember, mom's blood pressure may run a little bit lower and their heart rate may be a little bit higher during pregnancy. That's a normal physiologic thing. So if her heart rate's 110 and her blood pressure is you know, 105 over 70 systolic, that's not necessarily hemorrhagic shock, even though the you know, shock index is greater than one. Uh, that may be okay for mom. But you do, have to keep, you do have to do all the stuff that you would do for anybody else that's bleeding. Potentially give IV fluids. Uh, <clears throat> monitor the patient. Check blood pressure frequently. Check mental status frequently. See if mom is pale or clammy or if she seems well perfused. And keep her warm. Um, how many times do we see folks that are uh, bleeding for one reason or another that are chilling out in the back of an ambulance uh, that's 72 degrees and just losing all their heat in the ambulance? Keep these folks warm. Keep blankets on them. Turn up the heat in the back of the ambulance. Anybody that's bleeding, uh, it needs to be borderline not standable in the back of the ambulance based on how warm it is. Now, do fundus massage. Feel for the fundus, and then it, when you find it, start pushing on it. Start massaging it around, because that a lot of times will cause it to tighten up, and that may fix your problem right there. Now, there's not a whole lot beyond that that we can really do, again, other than putting pressure on something that we can see directly bleeding, uh, other than get them to the hospital. This is sort of like trauma, but just to the GU tract. So we gotta go someplace uh, and take them someplace that has OB because otherwise it's gonna be another transfer because there's nobody in the ER that's gonna be able to like whack, you know, fix this thing other than an OB guy probably. Now, if the guy, if she's peri-arrest and you just gotta go someplace that's got a little bit safer conditions than what you've got right now, okay. Uh, but bear in mind, if there's any chance at all that the person can safely get to someplace with OB, go someplace with OB. This is just a cool poster. I'll give you about five seconds to read it. Uh, you know, from the craft slices. I thought it was funny. All right, so postpartum hemorrhage. It's hemorrhage. Treat it like hemorrhage, except make sure you push on the, try doing the fundal massage because that will fix a lot of uterine atony um, <clears throat> a lot of times. But otherwise, they need to go someplace uh, that's got blood and uh, cold steel. All right, so you again complete that transport. You get her safely to an OB unit. 
uh, we clean the vehicle yet again because that's been the thing. We go ahead and stop and get lunch at, well, everything is uh, out of the way at this point, so we stop at the uh, grocery store and pick up a bag of chips or something like that. And no sooner do we get back to the station and start the coffee pot than we're called out to an 18-year-old female with bleeding. Only this time, we're showing up, and it looks something like this. Huh. Different situation. We find out the patient is uh, uh, bleeding, but she's not bleeding from her GU tract. She's bleeding from her leg. And also, she seems to have a pneumothorax. And also, she seems to have a bad head injury. And yes, she's also 32 weeks pregnant. Trauma in pregnancy is a, uh, uh, a high-risk condition, of course, and even minor trauma in pregnancy can be a big thing. What do you do with it? You treat them essentially the same. Now, this is going to mount when you say, I've got a pregnant trauma patient coming in, even if it's relatively minor trauma, that's essentially going to garner like a full trauma response from most hospitals. If you've got a trauma program or an OB program, if you radio in and say, I've got a trauma alert or whatever you call it, uh, that's going to get everybody down there because... Folks are worried about the baby. There's only so much that we can really do without having the obstetrics guys there or somebody that can get this baby out if need be. Um, and they can be a little bit complicated to resuscitate, but realistically, it's not that different than anybody else. We do routine care. So ABCs, remember that babies uh, love oxygen and are very intolerant of CO2. So this is somebody where the risk benefit of putting oxygen on somebody who is sort of borderline, otherwise wouldn't need it, it may be worthwhile because babies don't tolerate hypoxia almost at all. And also, if they need assisted respirations, this is somebody that I would bag relatively quickly because they're intolerant to CO2. And they also don't like hypotension. So you got to treat these folks pretty aggressively. You should resuscitate them per your protocol for whatever their traumatic thing is, knowing that the baby is there. You know, if, if mobilization is your thing, then like, okay, you can do it. But remember, these folks have a big weight sitting on their IVC and on their aorta. Uh, <clears throat> that big weight is the baby, and it sits right in the middle there. And if you lay this person on their back, uh, they get fairly, uh, fairly orthostatic, if you want to call it that, fairly quickly because you impair blood flow back from the lower extremities. You squish the IVC, and <clears throat> um, then the blood can't, or blood can't return to the heart. The heart can't pump what it doesn't have, and so the patient gets essentially hypotensive or uh, shocky because you've decreased decreased half their blood volume because it's all sitting down in their legs and their lower belly. How do you fix that? You plop something up underneath the patient's right side so that they're sort of, it shifts the baby over to the left side. Now, that's got to be about 30 degrees, which really is, it's not just a little like, little turn, something like that. It's basically up on the patient's side. It, it is pretty extensive, like to actually get the baby off there. You could do manual uterine displacement, like d literally just grab your paramedic student and say, hey, buddy, push on the baby and you push the belly over to the other side. <clears throat> but that's going to take a lot of, uh, somebody's got to continue to do that. That takes up hands. If you can wedge these folks, uh, that's probably a little bit uh, easier way to do it. And again, how high do they have to go? 30, 45 degrees, which is about, you know, like that. They will pretty much be looking at you on their side. Anybody, that's by the way, anybody that's 20 weeks gestation or higher, uh, some folks, I think, if I remember, my wife may be listening right now and she'll probably kill me for saying this. I think she started to get symptomatic whenever she would lay on her back, like 16 weeks or something like that. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot, especially if the person's kind of small to start off with. But certainly anybody greater than 20 weeks gestation should not lay flat on their back in an ambulance. Uh, even if they've been in terrible trauma and you're pretty sure they've got a spine injury, you should turn them over to the side. The lateral trauma position is actually just as safe for a spine as anything else is. So feel free uh, and bump them up to about 30 degrees or so. Now, the other thing in trauma, the patient's hurting. What can I give her for pain? Uh, we all get nervous about what kind of drugs can we give uh, to, to pregnant women. <clears throat> there are classes of drugs, and they start with A, B, C, D, uh, and then like the X. X means don't give it at all. Uh, D's basically mean you could give it, but it's probably, it has a high chance to hurt the patient. C is basically, we don't know. We don't have anything that says it's definitely unsafe, uh, but be kind of careful with it uh, because we just don't know. Uh, and B's are like, yeah, it's, it's almost certainly okay uh, for the baby. <clears throat> so drugs that we might give in the field, all kind of follow along this thing. For the most part, almost everything is a C. Like probably not going to hurt as far as we know, but uh, we can't say that it definitely couldn't. With the exception, essentially, of a lot of the benzos, if the patient is, you know, late-term pregnancy, um, and amiodarone, 
there's really not a lot that we would be given that is that's going to be really dangerous for the baby. Maybe aspirin, if it's third trimester, again, what's the, what's the concern with the benzos? It is that it could cause respiratory pr- depression if the baby has to come out. But that's relatively, uh, you know, and we know that happens, but that's a relatively low price to pay if the patient is having, you know, intractable seizures and getting hypoxic and hypercarbic, which is bad for the baby, as we kind of talked about. So uh, it, is, it is okay to give most of the drugs that we will be giving. You should avoid amiodarone uh, if you can in, uh, in pregnancy. Now, to mention minor trauma here, uh, it again is difficult to sort these folks out because they're typically, the, the pregnant patients, it can be difficult to sort out who's having big problems because again, your heart rate goes up a little bit when you're pregnant, just as a result of things. Your blood pressure goes down a little bit when you're pregnant. Your respiratory rate goes up. These are all the signs we look for of somebody being in shock. And the problem with pregnancy, especially later pregnancy, is that even minor trauma can be significantly bad for the person. So whether it's the slip and fall in the grocery store on some, you know, on a wet thing over in the produce section versus the major MVC versus the minor fender bender, all these folks are almost equally likely to be sick and may hide it from you. So essentially anybody that's pregnant should not refuse transport to the hospital. If she absolutely won't, then like, okay, you still can't tie them down and, uh, and kidnap them, but you, we should realistically not let anybody who is pregnant more than, again, about 20 weeks or so uh, refuse a transport. We, we have to make these people get to the hospital by hook or by crook. Why? Because they have to get checked out, if for no other reason than placental abruption. Uh, what's abruption? It is, remember that your, your uterus uh, or your plac- the placenta kind of hangs on the uterus and puts these little fingers into the uterine muscle itself, but those separate relatively easily. Those can get kind of ripped off uh, without too much problem. Again, even a slip and fall in the grocery store onto your butt uh, can cause your placenta to start separating from the uterine wall. When that happens, those are very vascular structures, and you start bleeding fairly quickly. Now, we are classically taught that placental abruption presents with vaginal bleeding and severe abdominal pain. The person may have not all that severe pain, and they may not have any vaginal bleeding. If you look on the side and see the concealed abruption where the center of the placenta just starts to lift off, uh, but the edges stay attached, you can develop this big hematoma. You can lose a lot of blood into that. Uh, So it it can be very difficult to figure out clinically who has an abruption and who doesn't. So almost everybody who is of a gravid, um, or has a a viable fetus should probably get observed, and people even close to that age should probably get observed for a little while to make sure that they are not abrupting, even after minor trauma, slips and falls. Again, funny. There's consequences to everything. All right. It's been a busy pregnancy-filled day, and it's getting on to evening. And we get another call about an 18-year-old female who is pregnant. She's not bleeding, but she is in respiratory distress. So you arrive on scene, you find an 18-year-old female with a big, full, gravid abdomen, uh, you know, 30, uh, 35 weeks, let's say, gestation. She's tachypnic, she's diaphoretic, she looks like hell, she's pale. She's got leg swelling, she's got bilateral rawls. Her blood pressure's in the 70s, systolic, her heart rate's in the 130s, her respiratory rate's in the upper 20s, and her SAT is 83. None of those are normal vital signs. Those are outside the realm of what you might even see physiologically uh, normal stuff for pregnancy. What is going on with this patient? I don't know, not yet. Uh, But what could be going on with her? Well, you could get an EKG and you might see something like this. Or you might do a little bit more studying and determine that you think she's probably got a PE. Or uh, she could be in just flagrant cardiac or uh, uh, cardiogenic shock. What kills pregnant people? Pregnant people tend to be relatively young. I can't say always healthy, but probably a little bit more healthy than the the average bird that EMS picks up. These folks are typically getting some kind of medical care uh, a lot of the time, uh, and there's not a whole bunch that have you know end stage CHF essentially uh, folks that get pregnant. Occasionally it does happen, but these folks develop those things uh, at the same rate as pretty much anybody else, uh, with the exception of MI. In in uh, young women. This is actually an interesting statistic. So MIs are rare in young people, you know, 20-year-olds. They do happen, but they're pretty darn rare. The folks, the young women that have an MI, 
it's almost always because they're pregnant. Like vast, vast, vast majority of MIs in young women, young otherwise healthy women, happen when they're pregnant. Um, <clears throat> and it looks like an MI. So if she's complaining of crushing chest pain, you got to think about the pulmonary embolism. Um, you got to think about pneumonia, infections, that kind of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> but if they're complaining of crushing chest pain and shortness of breath, getting an EKG, there's a, you may see the MI even on a 22-year-old uh, person when they're pregnant. Again, pulmonary embolism is there because you have decreased, you have uh, the hormonal changes that increase your predilection to clotting as well as decreasing venous return from your legs. Uh, there's a chance of infection, um, <clears throat> which you may look for, especially somebody, oh yeah, I think my water broke two days ago and now got a fever. Uh, that's, that's a pretty bad sign. And there's the amniotic fluid embolism. <coughs> Uh, where basically amniotic fluid enters your uh, vascular system. And uh, you, there's not a whole lot that you can really do about that other than hopefully CPR and get them to the hospital. Uh, but big thing about pregnant people, MIs and PEs, uh, otherwise young, healthy people. Now, what do you do about this person? Even if it has nothing to do with the pregnancy itself, it's an MI, it's a uh, PE, the person got stabbed. Remember that the survival of the baby is tied to the survival of the mother. So for the moment, you can almost forget that the baby is there. Um, <clears throat> if the patient needs O2, absolutely give them O2, as we kind of said before. If they're hypotensive, you can give them fluids, you can give them drugs. Uh, you know, if you had to give them a little scusha epi uh, because they're about to code otherwise, like that's, that's okay. Do they need to be intubated? You go ahead and intubate them. Now, watch out because pregnant people will, their oxygen consumption is huge and they will become hypoxic really quickly. So make sure they're really well pre-oxed as best you can. If you have to bag, be very careful uh, bagging because they also don't have a whole lot of stomach uh, because of this giant uterus that's pushing up on it. They're at high risk for reflux. These can be difficult and dangerous cases to intubate, but if they need it, then you need to do it. Um, if they're in VF, is it okay to shock them? Well, you got the baby sitting there. Yeah, it's actually okay. The amount of energy that's transferred to the baby is relatively low. You're keeping it up on the uh, uh, chest itself and, and not trying to go through the baby itself. But if mom is in VF, then yeah, you should probably shock mom. Um, because if mom's heart's not beating, then we're not doing the baby any favors. And again, risk benefit is well on the side of let's take the tiny bit of risk for the potentially big benefit. So we should do, uh, <clears throat> we go back to our patient, we uh, establish an IV. We start on our crystalloid bolus because we just don't have whole blood uh, sitting out there. Maybe we will soon, but we don't have it right now. Put her on 100% non-rebreather. Seems pretty reasonable. Uh, again, we've got this EKG now that shows tachycardia, but no STEMI. And blood pressure starts to fall. Patient's getting more pale, less responsive. And then all of a sudden we see this. Bad sign, again. Cardiac arrest in pregnancy. Uh, has to be dealt with a little bit different than other cardiac arrests uh, because there's a, there's a real specific goal. Usually there's not a lot that we'll do in the hospital that you couldn't do in the field. In this case, there is one thing uh, that, we, that we will do, and I'll get to that in just a second. But these are not folks to work on, on the field. These are not folks to do essentially any kind of resuscitation. Yes, do as good a chest compressions as you can. Yes, manage the airway as best you can while you are moving towards the hospital. Um, make sure this patient is either turned, like up on, on the backboard, turned at 30 degrees, or that somebody does manual uterine uh, displacement. <clears throat> because again, this is a low flow state, and if you're squishing the IVC and you already can't get blood back to the heart worth a damn in CPR to start with, you're only going to make it worse. So make sure that somebody is displacing the uterus uh, <clears throat> during, uh, during chest compressions. You can see that down in the uh, bottom section there. Uh, that guy's kind of half-heartedly giving a little push. It is going to be very hard to do chest compressions on somebody at 45 degrees, even with a Lucas device. So go for the manual deflection and do good chest compressions. You do need to ventilate these people. Babies don't like CO2. So uh, we have to be very cognizant of that and try to ventilate them as best as we can. <clears throat> um, we can defibrillate like normal. And then again, are we at the hospital yet? We've done all this stuff, but we've done it not in the house. We've done it driving as fast as we can to get to the hospital. Why? Because in a pregnant person with a viable fetus, the indication, the thing we are supposed to do in the hospital, in the ER, is a peri, you could call, the people call it different ways, perimortem C-section is the way that it was always described, perimortem fetal extraction, or maybe the, the nicer way to say it is the resuscitative uh, fetal extraction. Basically what you do, and any, any ER doctor should be able to do this uh, because it's part of, our, part of our training, this is the thing. If the patient shows up in cardiac arrest 
and they have a uterine fundus at the umbilicus or a little higher, you assume that that is probably a viable fetus, potentially. Um, and so you make a big cut, essentially from like sternum down to pubis. You deliver the uterus out, you cut a hole in the uterus, and then you scoop the baby out. That's good for mom, theoretically, and good for baby. Good for baby because you free it from the dying mother and you're uh, hopefully able to provide it some chest compressions, drugs, airway, whatever it needs to survive on its own uh, outside mom. That's why we only do it on viable, viable babies or potentially viable babies. It's good for mom because it gets the baby out of there, uh, and the baby is no longer this, this sink of oxygen and uh, this big weight that pushes on her belly. So a lot of times we do, we do a lot more good for baby, and mom may actually come back after we get baby out uh, and get them delivered and only focus on mom. That's why you have to go fast to the hospital, because this has to happen theoretically pretty quickly. Uh, if you can get it done within about four minutes is the, uh, is the number. So if you, if you have a physician that can respond within four minutes or you know, under 10 minutes to your location, then you might consider stopping or you might consider doing your resuscitation in the field. Um, but, that, but baby's got to come out. And most of us don't have the physician that is willing to respond and do a perimortem uh, or resuscitate a fetal extraction within about four minutes. So you're probably going to be best to beat it to the hospital as fast as you can. We're getting towards the end. It's now dark. It's a pleasant, we'll say, summer evening in Cincinnati. We're looking out over the river. You got one more call. It's for an 18-year-old female. She's not bleeding. Thank God. We've washed the truck too many times tonight. She is pregnant. 30-ish weeks or so, maybe, we think. I don't know. She's called, you're called for unconsciousness. You arrive and you find a young adult female with vital signs, as you see, a little on the hypertensive side, but otherwise good. GCS of 15. She's sitting upright in bed. The uh, story is that uh, she vomited a lot today, maybe had a little bit of a headache. She's gotten, you know, occasional headache during the uh, pregnancy. Uh, she had some pretty bad morning sickness when pregnancy first started. It had kind of gone away, uh, but it's back today, so she didn't think a whole lot about it. She seems okay right now. Her husband noted that she was snoring loudly tonight, and she doesn't snore previously, and, and the husband thought this sounded really weird and tried to, like, wake her up and couldn't wake her up, and she seemed to be kind of making a <sighs> noise. And that didn't seem like her. And so the husband called 911, and by the time you all arrived, she is the way that she is right now. No contractions, no leakage of fluid, no bleeding, and yes, she feels the baby move okay. Somebody to be concerned about? Mm, she looks okay right this second. There was one clue in there that's maybe something uh, probably pretty bothersome about this person. You assess her and find her airway to be patent. Her respirations are clear and unlabored. She's got a normal cardiac exam. She has a gravid uterus, and she's a little bit tender to palpation in her right upper quadrant, but she's kind of sore all over. You know, baby's big, and it kicks her in the ribs and the liver all the time. You notice that she's got a pretty significant amount of edema, though. Like her hands are really swollen, and her feet are really swollen. Um, maybe hands even more so than feet. And she says, yeah, I've, I've been swollen in my legs all through my pregnancy. I haven't really noticed my hands before. So now what? Well, the good news is that uh, this lady makes it easy on you. She was thinking about maybe refusing and then all of a sudden stops refusing to go to the hospital anymore because she starts to do this. She has a seizure in front of you. And you're pretty convinced that this isn't a uh, uh, pseudo-seizure. <clears throat> you think this is real. And you're now really worried about this patient because she's gone from what was preeclampsia to outright eclampsia. So preeclampsia, uh, the big thing that we worry about in pregnancies and young, otherwise healthy folks. Uh, <clears throat> if I, I kind of mentioned before, the killers of pregnant women, number one is hemorrhage, number two is PE, number three is eclampsia. It's not all that uncommon in pregnancy, about 5%, which is 1 out of 20. Uh, to progress to eclampsia itself is about 0.05%. Uh, so that's pretty rare, especially now that we have recognition and treatment. But if you have eclampsia, it's got about a 36% mortality, which is a lot. Uh, that's pretty bad. <clears throat> it's uh, after 20 weeks and almost any time after 20 weeks until about six weeks or uh, a couple of months after their pregnancy, uh, you could be at risk for preeclampsia. What is it? Uh, the actual what is it we'll get to in a second, but the symptoms that folks typically see, well, you may have some swelling. Well, pregnant people have lots of swelling, uh, especially in their lowers, but not so much in their upper extremities often. So swelling in the hands may be, a, may be a sign. It's not specific per se, but it's bothersome. New headaches, 
Proteinuria is the big thing. You're spilling protein in your urine and then visual changes. Things look funny. Uh, I see halos. I see uh, wavy lines, something like that. That kind of stuff is bothersome in the, the later term pregnant patient. <clears throat> Why does preeclampsia happen? What is it actually? It is probably uh, essentially vasoconstriction. Uh, throughout the body. We're not really sure why this stuff happens. It probably has something to do with the placenta, either it being there or the stuff that it makes, the hormones that it makes. It is a state of high vascular resistance with relatively low intervascular volume. So what does that mean? It means you, you get hypertensive and then as things progress, you develop problems in your brain, like not only cerebral edema, but vasoconstriction in your brain. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, then you lead to things like seizures, which is the actual eclampsia. So preeclampsia is the high vascular resistance that leads up to eclampsia, which is when it's enough to actually cause you to start seizing. Probably has something, again, to do with the, uh, with the placenta. Why do they seize? Again, we're not entirely sure whether it's that your brain gets irritated, uh, but we know that it does it. And when that happens, you have a, that's, that's a big deal. That's probably a big problem. There's also this HELP uh, syndrome uh, where folks get hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets uh, in the setting of hypertension and proteinuria in pregnancy. That, again, is one of the more serious, uh, serious things that happen. When somebody gets HELP, then they're like, oh, crap, this person's really sick. You're not going to make that diagnosis in the field, but you may get asked to transport that person. Uh, so that's why I bring it up. How do they present again the history? Maybe it's revealing, maybe it's not. But we find that they have hypertension, uh, edema in the upper rather than the lower extremities with sudden weight gain or looking really puffy around the face is uh, uh, a concerning finding. Headaches, visual changes, and right upper quadrant pain, classic ones that you find. What should we do about it? Well, number one, we do the ABCs. So we treat airway, but be aware that they may have pulmonary edema, they may have increased secretions, they may have some facial edema with it, it may be a hard airway to manage. We need to keep their SpO2 greater than 95, and this we need to treat again aggressively because baby, who is probably still in the belly, uh, does not tolerate hypoxia very well at all. So keep their SpO2 greater than 95, <coughs> and then maintain their circulation. Uh, and you may consider bolus IV fluid in this person. You may say, well, wait a minute, she's hypertensive. Um, yeah, but she's probably actually vascularly depleted. So a bit of IV fluid in these folks is not necessarily a bad thing. Even if they're hypertensive, you're not going to make the hypertension worse. And what else? The classic treatment for preeclampsia is, this is, an easy, this is a uh, common test question. You see it on registry or on any of your paramedic school boards. Magnesium. Um, how much magnesium? Not a gram, not two grams, four to six grams over 20 to 30 minutes, which is basically take your four to six grams of magnesium, stick it up there and let it drip. Um, maybe not quite as fast as you might do like a TXA, something like that. But this needs to go in actually relatively rapidly. Um, don't, don't extend this out over a period of an hour four to six grams over probably 20 minutes, uh, especially because this person is going to be fairly sickly. Now, in your initial bolus, the things that might happen is they might get uh, they might get a little hypotensive. That'll probably go away. Uh, there's probably not a whole lot else that'll happen in this this initial dosing of it. Now, say the person is seizing. Um, <clears throat> what if that doesn't work? Benzodiazepines to stop the seizure are actually okay. Uh, we should be given the mag, but again, are you going to let this person seize for 30 minutes while you're delivering in six grams of mag? Probably not. Uh, it is reasonable to go ahead and stop the seizure with your normal doses of benzodiazepines, which may be effective, and then let the magnesium continue on in the same time. What about the blood pressure? Should we aggressively treat that? Well, the magnesium is going to mostly do that. And magnesium does that because it's essentially a calcium channel uh, inhibitor. It essentially works like a calcium channel blocker. Um, <clears throat> but it'll, it'll treat the blood pressure. That's sort of what it's there for. You don't necessarily have to treat it in the field if you're given the mag. And in fact, I would probably recommend not treating it other than using the magnesium. You don't need to give these people a beta lol or hydralazine. Don't worry about it. It's not The blood pressure is a more or less a symptom and not necessarily the cause. So don't worry about the blood pressure per se. You're treating the problem with the mag. And then expeditious transport, transport because again, these people are pretty sick. All right. That was preeclampsia uh, and all the pregnancy stuff. So let's talk about six things to remember. Good fetal care comes from good maternal care. What's good for the mom is typically good for baby. <clears throat> so if you resuscitate mom appropriately, you're doing good stuff by the baby. 
Keep in mind that if you're called to a uh, house and the baby is coming out, that babies have been delivering themselves for years and most of them do okay. Uh, they may need a little bit of help from us, but most of the time this is not going to be that big a deal. So uh, use your, don't lose your head, uh, use your training and deliver that baby if it's crowning in the house. If there's a complication though, uh, get them to the hospital. Babies love oxygen and hate carbon dioxide, so we have to make sure these uh, moms don't get hypoxic and that they ventilate well. Uh, maternal, maternal cardiac arrest is not one that you are going to treat in the house. You need to get them to the hospital, to an emergency department as fast as you can. And in this case, it doesn't matter if they have OB or not, uh, because the big thing is baby just needs to come out and that doesn't have to happen in the hands of an obstetrician. We'll do our best. Placentas. Uh, good for baby, bad for mom. And the treatment, honestly, the end result treatment of eclampsia and preeclampsia is getting the placenta out. Uh, so delivery of the baby if at all possible. But obviously, you're not going to be worried about that. You just got to get them someplace where they can get baby out safely. And then uh, keep in mind that hypertension in a pregnant woman is worth a trip to the hospital before it ends up in the eclampsia. What actually happened to that lady that I mentioned in the case? Well, it was probably that she was a bit hypertensive. She actually had a seizure while her husband was asleep. He found her sort of postictal and woke her up in the meantime. Um, and that was the weird breathing and snoring thing. <clears throat> eclampsia is a bad thing and uh, we need to aggressively treat it. And a big part of aggressively treating uh, eclampsia and preeclampsia is getting them someplace that can do that. So uh, compel these people, if at all possible, if you're hypertensive and pregnant uh, and you weren't hypertensive before, then you need to go to the hospital.